Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Malthouse Games Podcast. I will be your host this evening. My name is Delton, and with me, as usual, is my lovely wife and yellow player, Haley. Good afternoon, listeners. This is episode number 48, which means we are very quickly approaching episode 50. Oh, you know what? Token Con episode should be episode 50. Wait, there you go. It works out since we're doing token con stuff. The stars have aligned. It's gonna happen. This is a podcast all about board games, card games, tabletop games, RPGs, and things of that sort. And this week, also about fire. Yes, so every time Haley comes home from a busy day, she always says that work was on fire. Everything caught on fire. Everything's on fire and this is how we die. That is like Haley's colloquialism for... I'm stressed. Like I said it at the bank whenever we got really busy, they'll be like, hey, how's it going? I was like, well, everything's on fire and this is how we die. That's just my saying. It's my metaphor for my stress. Well, guess what happened on Friday, everybody, ladies and gentlemen? So first of all, last week was a wonky week. First of all, Oklahoma had a tornado about two and a half miles from our house in the middle of August, which is weird. Luckily, it never touched down on the ground, but... It was still in the sky, and it was still a tornado, which was always terrifying. And still destructive. Yes. No, it it did touch the ground, anyway. I think it'd just be a funnel cloud if it didn't touch the ground. I don't know. But anyway, uh, so we had a tornado on Monday night, so we had to go to our neighbor's shelter. We're grateful for Sherry. And then, because of the tornado and all the storms, about, at one point, at least 15% of Oklahoma City was out of power which means that my building was out of power, which means that we were closed on Tuesday for inclement weather, which was weird to have a random Tuesday off in the middle of the week. And then I had to go to Elk City for a couple of days for family purposes. And then Friday I come into work and I have this backup of clients to see because we are closed on Tuesday and I was out on Thursday. And I'm sitting in a family session and the power goes out. And it's been storming that day. So I'm like, oh man, that's That's weird. So we go out into the hallway and my clinical director is like, all right, everybody go back in your rooms. Everything's okay. The lights come back on. We sit down. Well, it's not about 45 seconds later that we smell this strange smell. And I hear something on my walkie talkie saying that everyone evacuate the buildings on fire. And I'm like, what? Turns out the room next door to mine is the IT room. Lightning struck our building. Our telephone box in the room next door was on fire in flames. In flames! I don't know how that happens. How lightning strikes in a telephone box in a room is just on fire. It's called electricity. But for that one thing to just combust, and so we all had to file out and get on the vans. It's pouring rain. Like, everybody is drenched in buckets. Like, all 80 kids. I work at a partial hospital for kids. Everyone's just soaking wet. And we get on the bus... And it's like, as I was on the very last bus, we get on the very last bus, we go to pull out our parking spot, and the firemen give us the all clear. They put out the fires. We all load back inside, soaking wet, finish up our day, and we still don't have telephones. We're still communicating via walkie-talkie like we're 13-year-olds in some Disney movie from 1986. So Haley's work actually caught on fire. Be careful what you speak into the universe, children, because it may come true. Don't cry, wolf. Don't cry, wolf. Is that (laughs) essentially the lesson here? (laughs) Don't cry, wolf. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. So Haley's had that crazy experience. And this is my second time being evacuated this month. I think we told everyone about the gas leak about three weeks ago. And everyone at work is blaming me for all of these incidents because apparently they've never had an evacuation until Haley came. And the thing is, I've had evacuations for gas leaks at every company that I've worked for in the last, or every mental health company I've worked for in the last three years. I think you just have a sensitive sniffer. Sensitive sniffer? Yeah. So you can smell the gas better than everyone else? Maybe so. I don't know if that's true. My many talents. Well, I mean, we've actually had gas leaks. Like, Deer Creek had a gas leak. Seasons had a gas leak. Positive Changes had a gas leak. So apparently I'm just either bad luck or up to no good. Gassy. You're just gassy. No. (laughs) You can't take my role. (laughs) Aside from your craziness... Uh, We went to Zach and Sarah's for the weekend, last weekend, and hung out, went to the gathering place, ate some food, played a couple games, and caught up before their baby arrives. Learned a lot about pregnancy. It's a scary, scary thing. It is horrifying. I am so happy for everyone who has children. I'm so happy for Zach and Sarah. Oh my God, pregnancy sounds just scary. Sarah let me feel the baby hiccuping. 
which was really strange. And then in my brain, I thought, she's hiccuping fluid. It's not air. It's a weird fluid hiccup. And then I got weirded out even more. But <laughs> it was kind of cool, but still. It was cool. It's I'm, horrifying. We're very excited to meet Miss Avery Patrice. Super, super excited. Uh, she should be here literally any time, so that's awesome. So we got to hang out with them. This weekend, we're going to back to Elk City to Haley's dad's 50th birthday party, it's which cool. should be a hoot. Wild, a hoot and a half. You realize I'm going to be tired at 1030 and want to go to bed. Well, you're going to be staying up until about 230 in the morning because uh, Birdie's going to be making us margaritas all night long. There's this thing called driving. I can drive and go take myself to bed. Nah. I'm an old fart. We'll see how long I can make it. Going to be a hoot and a holler and a half. Going to have a honky tonk with Hank. A hanky tonk. Hanky tank. So that's really all that's been going on. Uh, Aside from that, we've been busy hanging out with friends, uh, doing cube drafts with Brian and some people, playing some games around the house. Not really anything too crazy. I folded all the laundry on my couch for the first time in three weeks. And there's laundry again now. Just one load now. We do a lot of laundry and dishes because we cook three meals. And uh, I guess, well, technically we cook two meals, but one of those has leftovers for the next day. And then we do laundry constantly. Yeah, because we eat out one day per week, and it's normally Friday nights when we Postmates tie to light. Yep. And so I told Delton we need to start eating out more. I think it actually saves us time and money at this point. Instead of Postmating? Oh, dishes? Yeah. Uh, all the water we're using? All the water we're using. It's fine. But aside from that, nothing else crazy. We did want to update on TokenCon, Oklahoma's board game convention in Oklahoma City. This is year number two. I think we've talked about it before. The dates are October... 4th through 6th. 4th through 6th. And we will be hosting the closing ceremonies slash award show at the end on Sunday at like 5 or 6 in the afternoon. So if you're attending Token Con, if you don't see us throughout the rest of the con, we'll be there pretty much the whole time, uh, you will definitely see us if you stick around for the closing ceremonies. And I recommend you do so because... It should be a fun time. We're planning on making it something you can come have some laughs, hear about what the community thinks about different games, as well as some other cool stuff. It'll also be a hoot and a holler and a half. Hope so. It will so. Now let's get into some beer. Let's get Hank's 50th birthday party started early. Oh, here's the door. It's straight ahead. It's, it's a game. Oh yeah, it's also my parents' anniversary this weekend. Is it really? They'll be 29 years married. Oh, boy, just one left. But, <laughs> <I'm> just... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to respond to that. I'm just kidding. So the first beer today is from Rough Tail Brewing Co., which is moving their brewery right down the street from us. Two miles. We're super excited for that because now we'll have Frenzy downtown Edmond and Rough Tail right outside of Edmond. And Batter Boar Brewing. We've also had Batter Boar, but Batter Boar doesn't sell in cans or bottles yet, and Rough Tail does. There was a lot of bees. That was quite an alliteration there. That was a lot of alliteration. Uh, this a literal is from, alliteration. A literal alliteration. This is from Rough Tail Brewing Co. It is Dad Talk. Talk. Why did I add an L? Dad Talk Lager. It's from their acrylic series, which I think is referencing the artwork on it, which looks like it was an acrylic paint-esque thing. It says, brewed by Rough Tail Brewing Co. Sadly, I don't see like any alcohol percentage, any descriptors of the beer. It's likely just a simple lager. So, last time my dad came up to stay the night whenever they bought their meat market, I took him to the Patriarch here in Edmond, and we got him some beer. And my dad typically drinks like Michelob Ultra and Bud Light and all that stuff. And we go to the Patriarch, which has a lot of craft brewery, or uh, craft brews. and Dad was like, this is what I drink, and tells the bartender, and the bartender goes, I know exactly what you need. And he sits uh, a glass on the table that has about two ounces of beer, and my dad drinks it and goes, yep, that's the stuff, and it is this. It is dad talk. But the thing is, I took a drink of it too. It is like a Budweiser got promoted. So based on the smell, it smells like a standard lager. It's got a little bit of an extra, like, pungentness. Not necessarily skunky, but there's a little extra kick in the scent. It's that Budweiser kick. It is just a classic lager, but it does taste like what all actual, like, lagers from the store should taste like. It's like what they should taste like. And my dad, he drank, like, five or six of these, and he was having a grand old time. 
And I made, it's not bad. I made fun of him the whole night because he was drinking the dad lager. And then our friend's parents joined us. And guess what they ordered? The same thing. The same thing. They go up to the bar and the uh, Cody's dad was like, I normally drink this, this, and this. And the bartender gave him a taster, two ounces of dad lager. And he's like, oh, yeah, that's it. And so my dad and his dad drank dad lager the entire night. Yeah, dad talk lager from Rough Tail. It is crisp on the front, kind of vacant in the middle palate, and then heavy on the back end in terms of the mouthfeel. But it's a basic lager, but there is no complexity to it. I think they did make this for dads that only drink shitty beer. I really think they do. And this is the like, you have craft beer? what, What can I drink in your house? And you're like, here, have a dad talk. And there you go. This is the beer that you drink that's your first beer and you're standing with your dad in the driveway when you're 17. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's not bad. It's pretty good. It's a basic lager. There's nothing fancy here. But if you're used to drinking Budweiser, Bud Light, you know, Michelob, that kind of stuff that you buy in a convenience store and all that stuff, uh, I think this is a good replacement. Seconded. Now, I wish I knew the alcohol content, but the can does not say. The that's alcohol okay. content is yes. Alcohol content is yes. So let's move into the game now so we can talk about this. The game today was given to us as a review copy from Hub Games. So shout out to Hub Games and Michael for giving us this copy and also being able to say hi at Gen Con even though he was busy, busy, busy. Howdy, sweet boy Michael. So this is Flip Over Frog. Now Flip Over Frog is a small box game that was originally published in Japan by... I think it's Gata 2, G-O-T-T-A 2. Game invention or game design was Okabe Takuya. Game development was Yangawa Kazutaka. Art direction, Anita Murphy. Illustration, Matthew Bolio. Graphic design, Kendall Patterson and Winnie Sheck. Rules were Michael Fox and project management were Emma Goody. Now, Flip Over Frog is a very simple, small box game. It comes with a single board with a 4x4 grid on it. And it comes with a bunch of square tiles that have a picture of a frog on one side, along with arrows going either up, down, left, right, so orthogonal or diagonal. The back side has a leaf. There are four that show a snake. And then there are four circular discs that show one of each color frog. So there are four different color frogs in this game. There's the like red to purple color, the blue, the green, and the yellow. The way the game is going to function is each player is given one of those circular discs with one of the frog colors. That is your secret color you keep hidden from everybody else. Secret frog! The way that you play the game is very simple. You will have a hand of three frogs. You will pick one, place it on the board. Any tiles that are directly next to it, whether it's diagonal or orthogonal, uh, depending on the arrow shown, you will flip over. Hence the name Flip Over Frog. So if you place a yellow frog down that has orthogonal, up, down, left, right arrows, and to the up and right side, there are two frogs, those would flip over to show the leaf side of their tile. Then you would draw a tile to fill your hand to three. Now the next player will go. The goal of the game is at the end to have more of your color showing face up on the board than the opponent's. The hard part about the game is memorizing where those flipped frogs went, but The big key is the snake tile you can use to remove the top frog that it sits on. Basically, you put it on top of a frog and it gets rid of it. African snake! African snake. Those who are cultured will know my reference. And then when a frog is flipped over and it shows the leaf side, you may place another frog on that. So then if it's flipped again, it goes from, let's say, a yellow frog flips upside down to now show a green frog. You can never place a frog on an existing frog unless it's flipped upside down, all those simple rules. But you're just going to place a frog, flip some stuff, your opponent's going to place a frog, flip some stuff, and it goes from two to four players. So what I find fun about this game is its super simplicity. You can explain it really easily. It's hard without having a visual element through the podcast, but it's very simple to explain. It's simple to show people how to play, and then you can get through a game in like 10 minutes. Little poison dart frogs on little tiles. It is little poison dart frogs, and they're super adorable. But my favorite thing that I have found with this game is being that you flip over frogs, and then when somebody places one on top of one that's face down, now if you flip it, it's just to the other frog on the other side, trying to memorize where your frogs were or what frog was where. So you might flip something and think, crap, that is not what I wanted to flip over. 
It makes me wish I would have paid more attention to those memory games in the second grade. That's a skill that you kind of need in this game some. That's a skill that I lost back in 2004. That you lost in 2004 or you just never gained? I I lost it back in 2004. I think that's the last time I've actually played a memory (laughs) game. This does have that element in it. I think the other thing I like is this is one of those games that you have to like kind of plan where you're going to flip, when you're going to flip, how far do you space people out? Do you place this one at a diagonal? to flip one frog, or do you sacrifice and flip one of your own frogs in hopes you can flip them back over later? Like, there's all kinds of elements of planning, and I hesitate to use the term chess-like play, but it is very much trying to anticipate what your opponents are doing, and you are. You're trying to figure out what color of frog that they have. Because if they're blue, and you suspect they're blue, if you start flipping blue frogs over, they're going to flip those back. So you can kind of plan, okay, they can flip this guy back in any one of these, let's say, two spaces, how can I benefit from that? Or how can I block that one of the two? So it can get, I think it could get a little mean, depending on who you're playing with and how good they are. But we haven't really encountered that yet. Because I'm a nice lady. I really like the game because it combines your working memory and strategy at the same time. You kind of have to keep track of what your strategy is, where different frogs are placed, what your partner just did and how that totally screws up things. I really like, you feel like you're balancing multiple things at once. Did you feel the same way? Definitely. Watching what other people do and trying to figure out who they are, plan what they did, but also memorize where the hell you put your frogs, it all plays together. I feel like halfway through the game, I completely forgot to memorize where the frogs were and I was like, oh (laughs) shit. Well, here's the thing too, is you haven't got to play a four player game like I have. Oh, that's right. And the the three and four player game definitely changes it because it's a more crowded board. More things are flipping. More spaces are being covered up. It's a lot more difficult because you have to plan further. You have to react more. Okay. You know what I mean? It, it, It changes from being a little bit of a strategic game. There's always just reaction to your opponent. I mean, that's a lot of this game. However, it's even just elevated to 11 when there's four players. It's like a game of tag. It kind of is, yeah. Well, I really like this as a two-player. I'm looking forward to playing it as a four-player. We have a Brian and we have an Allison. We can combine them. It's a really, really, really simple game. It sounds like it is a different game at four. It is. It's a bit of a different game at four, uh, but it works well at two. It works well at four. Two is going to feel very competitive. Four is going to feel a bit more random because, yes, you're drawing tiles off the top, but playing those in the right way, playing those to order your plays the best you can, using the snakes in the best position. Uh, Using the snakes, by the way, is tough at four because it opens up for other people. Because in a two-player game, you use the snake, removes a frog, then your opponent goes, then you get to go again, hopefully benefiting from where that snake went. But in a four-player game, it's a lot different. I do not recommend playing this game while you are drinking or doing anything like that because if it impairs your memory, if it impairs your cognitive function, you will fall behind really quickly. You got to not that it's a difficult game, but you have to stay alert. You really do. You just have to watch your opponents. It's a really, really simple game. It's like I said, it's not difficult to explain. The rules are one page. The back page of the rules is just an advertisement for their other games, basically, and a big photo. So it's really simple. It's a great travel game. You could play this easily at a restaurant. You can take it. It's like I said, two, three, or four player. So. It's a great game. I think the retail cost is like 15 bucks. Pocket change. Which is great. Yeah, it's an affordable game. It's fun. And I feel like it's one that you'll break out a lot with new people, but you'll also break out between big games just so you can still have a fun experience in that 15 minutes and you're not going to get a lame experience. You're always going to have fun with it because it's a good game. And it's cute. It's just, uh, it's simple. It's, it's simple. It's short to play, but it does have that strategy and that memory element, and I feel like it's just a a really good game in a small box, small package. In the words of Delton, it's solid. Yeah. I like it a lot. There's not too much more to say about it, I don't think, but we've really enjoyed our time with it. So thank you, Hub Games. Yes, thank you, Hub Games, for this, and definitely go check it out. It's such an affordable price tag. It's easy to nab, and then don't forget, they also had Holding On, Troubled Life of Billy Kerr, which is still was our game of 2018, and uh, I still recommend that to everybody if you want a fun experience and a scenario-based game where you can build through it. Yeah, and you can see our review of that on YouTubes. Oh, that's true, you can. I think that that covers Flip Over Frog. Why don't you say we hop on over to the topic? Hey, 
can I get you? I'd like a topic. Any special way? Make it a top shelf topic. Coming up. Enjoy. Mah. That wasn't as bad as last week's transition. That was not as bad as last week or the week before is when you segue, your segue had square wheels. I think, was that last week? Or, I'm sorry, two weeks ago. That was two weeks ago. I forget that our podcast is every two weeks, not, not every <laughs> week. Are you ready for beer number two? That is a fast drink of a beer for the episode compared to usual. That was like college party level. Well, no, not near that, but still. Down the hatch. What's next, Gooby? So this is Purple Haze from Abita Brewing. This is a raspberry lager that comes in at 4.2 alcohol by volume. It says, experience the magic of Purple Haze. Clouds of real raspberries swirl in this tart and tantalizing lager inspired by the good spirits and dark mysteries of New Orleans. Brewed with pilsner and wheat malts along with Vanguard hops, let the scent of berries in the hazy purple brew put a spell on you. I really hope this is better than the last Abita that I had. There, you know, having been in college, there's not a lot of beer that I'll turn down if it's free. Like, I'll, I'll drink cheap beer if I have to. I mean, if it's the only option, then you kind of have to. Um, but one time we had a Halloween party and somebody left the Abita alligator ale at our house. And I, tip, I rarely ever find a beer that I don't, I can't at least drink, but man. I, I could not stand that alligator ale. It was like drinking, like you dropped a piece of licorice in dirt. I don't really have high expectations for this one, just with my past with the beta, but hopefully my mind has changed. Hopefully so. Let's give this a smell. I can smell the berry. Yes. Being a lager, you can tell it's light. There's that little bit of a lager smell. Fruitier than the dad lager. Definitely. There's not as much tart as I expected for a raspberry. It's pretty gentle in terms of tartness. It tastes like raspberry lip smackers. I don't know what a lip smacker is. It is the chapstick that all girls in the late 90s, early 2000s carried in their clear plastic purses. I love how you referenced it like, this tastes like a lip smacker, as if I would know what a <laughs> lip smacker tastes like. Hey, you hung out with a lot of girls. Yeah, in high school. Well, they might have still had lip smackers. Those were around until at least probably our freshman year. Does your foam have a tiny hint of like a purple lavender color to it? I think so. It's so gentle. Yeah, there's not. It's smooth. I'm trying to get like a, a, a handle on it. It really hits you the same in the front and the middle palate as you, like mouthfeel, but the back froths up a little bit. And then it dissipates. Then it just kind of goes away. It doesn't have too much residual. Because sometimes on the podcast when I edit, I can hear that, like, my mouth feels, like, wet from a beer. You know what I mean? That frothiness. And this doesn't have as much of that. It's pretty crisp. The flavor's pretty tame. The tartness is really tame. The raspberry's really tame. It's not... I actually like the other lager better. See, I think I like this one. Abita has really moved up a notch. I mean, anything's going to beat that alligator ale. That was just awful. So, This isn't yeah. bad. I just, I want more raspberry from a raspberry lager. Yeah, I agree. I think that's what it is. They set me up with, you know, the name Purple Haze and the cool label and all that stuff. And then it's like a hint. It's like they put a drop of raspberry. It's just so light compared to what I'm used to. If you're wanting something in New Orleans, it has to be like 45% alcohol and stab your taste buds with a knife. Yes. That's what I expected. That's not what we got, but it's still good. It is still good. So the topic for today... We actually wanted to do a kind of a 2.0 of a topic we did when the podcast first launched, which is travel games, or as Haley likes to call them, purse games. Even though I don't carry a purse. Even though you no longer carry a purse ever. Part of the reason we thought of this is because, as I said about Flip Over Frog, is it's a small box. There's not too many pieces. It's a small board. Not much table space it takes up. You could take this to a restaurant. This could be played on a plane or on a train. Or in an automobile. You really could play this in pretty much anywhere like that. So it's a good travel game. And I feel like we've added games to our uh, shelves that are travel worthy. Or games I would like to take and travel with and so on. So we thought about retouching on travel games. The biggest thing that matters in travel games is definitely the size of the box. That's the first part. 
because usually wherever your destination is, you could get a bigger table if need be, but you must be able to travel easily with it. The second biggest thing with travel games is the counterpoint to that almost is footprint on the table. Because we have travel games that are fine at the destination, but sometimes you want to play them during the travel on a plane, on a train, things like that. And so Flip Over Frog fits both of those. And then we've had some new games come up now, depending obviously how many people you are with or are going to end up with. Uh, we have some other options. See, ever since we got the game, I have thought Railroad Inc. is the perfect travel game because it reminds me of those little $1, the $2 dry erase board games that you would get at gas stations along I-40 back in the day. You know, you'd like go into a gas station, your grandma give you five bucks, and you can get like a candy and a pop and whatever else you wanted. And the, they cost like a dollar. They came in a little plastic container. But you could play Hangman on it. You could play Tic-Tac-Toe on it, even though you could play that on a napkin if you wanted to. But it has it's the same like little markers and board, and so it really is nostalgic for me. And so ever since we got that game, all I can think about is it's a travel game. It even has a little magnetic case that a lot of those games came with. So I never had those, but I could see that. And you could even, if it was just two of us going, we could just take two markers, the four main dice, and two boards. You wouldn't have to bring the box. Right. On a train or a plane. Because in exactly. a car, that'd be hard. Exactly. But, I mean, even <laughs> Don't then, pull over. It's your turn. Right. Even then, the box is small, so you could take it wherever. It holds up to six people as well in that small box. Or as few as one. Or as few as one. So if you're traveling alone, you could always just take a board in your backpack with a marker and the four dice. Call it good, which is nice and awesome. Right. I think other ones we've added that are kind of big hits for us, uh, depending on how many people you're going to end up with, Three Laws of Robotics is a very small box, and you could make it smaller if you basically, you could make it smaller if you wanted to, probably by like leaving out the, um, whatever the little cards are, like those tiny cards. Not the, not the point ones, but the, the tokens. Ah, the tokens. Or when you catch yeah. somebody, and if you just remember that or mark it some other way, but it's a small box. It's easy to travel with. I also think that pretty much all of the Oink Games series, they're just so good since we finally have them, since we have insider startups and fake artists. In terms of playing on a plane, uh, startups would be the only one, but you would really have to pack the number of coins you're going to need or separate them because I would hate to open that box, get the cards out, dig through all the coins because it's so packed in there. I would rather have just a baggie in my backpack of the coins or something. Be an infomercial waiting to happen. Do you have too many coins? <laughs> oh! <laughs> Lose them all over. They're hitting people in different rows and stuff. And all the other passengers are giving you these dirty looks, and you're like, what? Yeah, that's exactly. I think you could also get away with playing Welcome To. Because especially on a train, like when we were on the train, we had slightly larger tables to play on. It's only three stacks of cards, and if each of you can have your little piece of paper to yourself, and that makes it easy to play. Yeah, you could play that on a plane, too. You would just have to make sure that those cards uh, basically don't fall over, which, you know, won't be too hard, uh, as long as you have room for the cards. But I think you could successfully play that on two uh, or three, depending on how many people you have, airplane tables. That's not too bad. And you could always just pack a couple sheets, especially if you laminate some and do dry erase. It'd be even easier. You wouldn't have to have the booklet or the box. You could just pack the cards up. I was going to say, can you imagine playing uh, two rooms in a boom on a plane, but then you don't want to talk about booms on planes? Yeah, you could change it to be like, I don't know, literally anything that, well, I don't want to say hot potato because I can't remember. I think there's a card that's the hot potato. So that might be out, but yeah, and you could do something like that. That's not lemonade. We've talked about before, I think, where you just don't take the cups. You just have some simple cards, nice and easy. And of course, the game and the mind, both of those would be great to play. Yeah, you, all you have to do is take the, one of those two and you could play the other with it. Right. So that's nice and easy. Any of those gumstick games, for the most part, I think are going to be able to work out. Uh, like we have Jim that we got at TokenCon last year. And Jim, it takes up a little bit of table space, but not un enough to, I think, overflow a like airplane table. Oh, those little high chair tables that airplanes give you. Yeah, those little seat back tables. I think that'd be good. And for our final game. Go for it. A classic game. What? A deck of cards. Oh, well, of course. That's an obvious one. Yeah, you can play Speed. You can play War. I, I have a seven-year-old that's trying to teach me how to play a game called Trash. 
Have you ever had have you ever had a seven year old try and explain to you rules of a game? I'm guessing the game's just trash. I I <laughs> she has tried probably four or five times, and I just do not understand. She's like, you just do this, this, and this. I'm like, that makes zero sense to me, child. Yeah, this zero. is not working. This does not make any sense. So I, I assume you could play trash on a plane, but then again, I have to actually learn how to play. We've added quite a few since the last time, but then again, it has been nearly two years since we recorded that episode. That's true. And last time we talked about, you know, like Tides of Madness and taking number nine, but just taking like two sets of numbers on our trip. Now we have a um, lot of actual small box games. Exactly. That's the thing I wanted to do was like, what are some of the new games we have that you could take that are small box, easy to play with like two players or more? And I think a lot of game companies are starting to go towards those small boxes. I think those are starting to catch people's eyes rather than the giant boxes. I think it's helping because shelf space is changed. Like it helps you have yeah, more you shelf have space. Yeah, you have less of it. Yeah, you have less of it with big games. You have more shelf space with small ones. Oh, I'm talking about you. Oh, I have less of it. That's Over very the last true. two years. Yes, it's definitely been. <laughs> slowly dwindling on how much space I have left. But there are games that you can travel with easily in small boxes and not take them out of the boxes. I have this weird thing where I hate taking games out, bagging them up and all that stuff. So if I can just leave it in the box, throw a rubber band around the box, or just put it in a pocket in my backpack the way you can with like the Oink games, it just works out. It's so much easier to do. So those are some of the new travel games that we have that are great for taking on a trip depending on, obviously, your number of people and where you're going, that are also fun, hopefully, to you, like they are to us. But that's just an updated list of what we did two years ago, uh, or I guess not updated necessarily, but additions we've updated with. Now I'm going to call them back pocket games. Back pocket games? Because I haven't carried a purse in like two years. They're just getting smaller and smaller? Hey, man, I got actual pockets now. I buy a boy's jeans. That's true. You have real pockets again. It's amazing. Oh, my God. Ladies, listen to me. Give me your listening ears. Oh, sorry, that's something I tell my kids. Okay, listen. So, boys' jeans, they make skinny jeans. And get this, they are typically half price. Half the price of women's jeans. And, get this, they fit the same. And, get this, they have real pockets so you can stick your whole hand in on the front and the back. I can fit my car keys in my back pocket and I got a crap ton of keychains because I'm that person. It's great. Buy you some boy jeans. It'll change your life. It'll make you believe in love again. Make you believe in love again? Yes. Or just never carry anything, ever. Minimalism. See, I have to warn you. <laughs> that, so all of you who have partners and you are the purse holder, about the first six months you go without carrying a purse, your partner's going to be like, hey, can you put this in your purse? Hey, can you put this in your purse? Here's the problem. Hey, can you put this in your purse? Then it turns around to where Haley's like, will you hold my phone while I go to the bathroom? I have pockets to hold it, but I don't want to use them. Revenge. No, I'm just going to stop doing it since you have pockets big enough now. I do have pockets big enough now, but it's kind of nice to get revenge. Nope, not doing it. Forever no it was, hey, I just bought this new toy. Can, can you put it in your purse? Hey, I just bought this. I don't want to carry this bag around the mall. Can you put it in your purse? It's easier for you to carry. Well, you know. If I had a backpack on, I'd let you do I, the same. I know. I, I, I offered to let you carry my purse, but you declined. <laughs> you didn't want to carry true. a cat purse. I did not want to carry a cat purse. So let's go to the question of the episode, Delty Poo. And now, join us for a Malt House Games podcast special bite size question. So for the question today, Haley came up with a good question that is... What is the worst combination of game with mode of transportation? So what would be the most disastrous? Haley, start us off. Hear me out. Sagrada in a tractor. In a tractor? In a tractor. But not just any tractor. Not a tractor like going down the, the highway or the going down the county road. A tractor that is actively working a field. So the kind of air conditioning and everything inside, but still bumping but around on the tiny, field. tiny, bumping around on the field. <laughs> Those big tires, they, they yeah. help, but they don't help that much. Yeah, of course. I was going to say, like, th just the next level up from that. Oh. Basically, or at least the most ridiculous I could possibly think of, which is something along the lines of, like, Twilight Struggle on a raft. Oh. <laughs> Just all the little chits sliding around and going everywhere. You, I mean, you'd be and then done. You'd flip over the raft about four or five times, spill your beer, and spill all the chits. I flip the kayak, not the raft. 
I said you would flip the raft. So story time. We went floating a river last year in September. Two years ago. Two years ago? Yeah. Uh, we probably talked about this at some point. We went floating a river and we had our own single person kayaks. And I decided to, to hop a tree log where some trees were all together and was going to hop out another one to leave the little area. Well, I hopped in and then I couldn't hop out. So I tried to back up to get some like momentum built to get out. And then I flipped over, lost literally an entire open beer. And this is like a 6% craft beer. Oh, so mad because we only brought 12 for the whole weekend. <laughs> I tipped my uh, ice chest off. It started floating down the river. It's the kind that's made to be waterproof and float in those scenarios. It worked. It worked. Uh, got my stuff, got my canoe, got back in the boat, pulled down a little bit. And there's this spot where it's really shallow over some pebbles. So the water picks up speed really fast. So let me stop you here. By this time, Delton has already... A secured another beer and opened it yes i have and i hit this area and i got the beer between my legs and zach's like hey paddle against it and try to get up here in this calm spot so i try to turn the canoe flop it over lose another entire beer lose my ice chest again which i grabbed with one hand literally while I've lost got the a canoe. Sixth <laughs> of our beer supply for the weekend due then, to I grab, shenanigans. then i grab the canoe and i'm bumping around these rocks hit me in the butt and the hip and the thighs I finally get down to the bottom of this fast area where I can like plant up again. Then the last time I flipped my canoe was purposeful and I had no beer, but that was when right. I tried to drift into a parking spot and just knew I was going to tumble. So I did it anyway. That was fun. But yeah, I'm pretty bad on uh, kayaks because I try to do dumb stuff. But that's what you're at the river for drinking in a kayak. But not losing beer as a party foul. Well, we should have taken cheaper beer. We should have taken more beer. Or more beer. Well, I think that that is going to wrap up this episode with a nice little bow on top. First, a shout out. Thank you very much to our Patreon backers, Allison, Alan, Jesse, and Catherine. Woo! All of you are awesome. Hopefully, you can indeed hear the improvement of audio quality since I got the Durham microphone amplifier booster preamp thingies from Cathedral Pipes. I don't know what that is, but I'm grateful for it. She's so grateful you. for it, so that works out. Yes, thank you so much for backing us. If you would like to be like them and get a shout-out here or post it on the end of our videos or a shout-out on Twitter or just support us monetarily, you may do so, patreon.com slash malthousegames. If you want to follow us on social media, we are at malthousegames on everything, M-A-L-T-H-A-U-S games. If you want to find me personally, I am at Delton Brack, D-E-L-T-O-N-B-R-A-C-K. Haley is at... S-Q-U-I-R-R-E-L-L-Y-G-E-E-K. At Squirrely Geek. If you have a topic that you would like us to cover, a game to look at, or even a question just to answer on the episode, as well as just general comments, you can send us an email, contact at malthousegames.com. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to this podcast. Don't forget we're on Spotify, so if you're listening on SoundCloud and thinking, this is too clunky, I don't like it, uh, I try to tell everyone we're on Spotify now because Spotify makes everything in life easier. <laughs> yes, it does. I love Spotify so much. Aside from that, we will see you all in two weeks from now with our next episode, 49, super close to 50. So until next time, sit back, relax, grab a drink, and play some games. We'll see you folks later. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.